News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. Good morning and welcome. Uh, Faraz is um, at home today. I'm Sonali Wanigababuge. And welcome to a brand new edition of uh, Newsline. Of course, it's the 15th of December 2016. We're all waiting for Christmas and uh, the holiday cheer is just setting in. Uh, in our studios today is uh, Professor Rajiva Vijay Singh, of course, no stranger uh, to the network. Good morning, Professor. Morning. Uh, you were a former State Minister of Higher Education and also, interestingly, a photographer. Yes. Uh, uh, tell us a bit about this uh, new designation, Professor. Well, I've been travelling a lot, as everyone knows, and I've been taking a lot of photographs. And I never, you know, thought of these as something for the public. But my aunt Ina de Silva, who I think had the best eye of any Sri Lanka for uh, art, once told me, you know, I think you have a wonderful eye. And, and then I started taking myself seriously. And uh, Aid at Axion, which is this uh, international aid organization, which does a lot of work with young people, had a photography exhibition some months back. And then I mentioned mine. They came and had a look and brought some people interested in art and said they were really quite good. And, you know, I gave a few samples. And they said, you know, two of these, and I thought they were going to say two of these are worth showing. And they said two of these are not very good, but the rest are marvelous. So they set on this exhibition, the Acting India High Commissioner opened it. It was called India and Beyond. And it deals with the uh, social, cultural, uh, scenic attractions of India. And I gave a little talk and it was quite well attended. I had lots of people from my past, you know, from my Peace Secretary days, from the conference building and stabilization session measures we had, people from my work now and a lot of friends. And it was a nice occasion. And I was really quite pleased at the way they, you know, they did large some of the frames. So Speak they look good. Yeah. Speaking of uh, India, Professor, um, in the aftermath of uh, Jailalitha Jairam's right. uh, demise, how do you view Indo-Sri Lanka ties? Um, is it going to change? Um, well, I don't know that Jailalitha's death would have much impact on that because I think the Indian government has tended to have to cope with Tamil Nadu. Sometimes from our point of view it seemed excessive, the indulgence. But I think they've managed it quite well. Um, I think the real problem that we have to face with India is which direction India is going in. You know, I get the impression that a lot of what might call traditional Indian foreign policy is being discarded uh, by the Prime Minister largely because he has a set of rather Western-oriented advisors around him. It was a bit like what happened to Mahindra Rajapaksa. You know, the traditional SLFP link with India, which was so important and which he had nurtured so well during the war, was discarded because he got very, very ridiculous advice. You know, India wasn't important, they didn't answer messages from Manmohan Singh, and as we all know, the foreign ministry was taken over by a cabal of people who kept saying our traditional ties are with the West. You know, when we lost in Geneva in 2012, an unnecessary loss, we had not really worked as Dan had done with the Third World. The Indian were very much on our side, the people there. But they got orders from Delhi against the advice of the foreign ministry. And one reason they got orders from Delhi is a letter from Manmohan Singh had been completely ignored by a foreign ministry. And as Tamara Kunnagam said, the problem was people like Shenuka Senratna were dealing with the Western ambassadors. And Shenuka had completely taken over Sajid. And between them, they destroyed Mahindra Rajapaksa internationally because they ignored India. Now, my worry is that even though the Modi government seems to be ignoring its traditional allies, India, like Sri Lanka, will have to revert to those traditional allies. You know, I think it was very heartening that Central Asia, the Indians included this in the exhibition, because the Indian Foreign Ministry, which is very wise, you know, the Acting High Commissioner made such an impressive speech, picking up on some of the ideas I gave, taking some social aspects, and the Indian Foreign Ministry, I think, understands the value of an internationalist perspective, not just pursuing a Western agenda. And I think if Sri Lanka, under Mangala Samarira, thinks that, you know, the way to keep India happy is to keep the West happy, I think it's completely wrong. They have to be very careful. You cannot have a Foreign Minister who basically says, I wanted Hillary Clinton to win. And I was told by one of my colleagues he was hoping for a UN job. 
Imagine the, PUA, PUA, the poor UN having this not very intelligent, not very moral form of fashion design in the UN. And this is what our foreign policy has come to. Kadara Kama, greed. Not the interests of Sri Lanka, not the interests of Asia. Professor, um, closer to home, um, let's talk about uh, governance in general. Can we be satisfied with the way the country is Absolutely going forward? Absolutely not. I think it's a disaster. I still don't regret the decision Vasantha Sinnak and I made. We were the only people who made that decision on principle. Because it now transpires that a lot of people who abandoned Mahindra Rajapaksa are doing for selfish reasons mm -hmm. and animosity towards the Rajapaksa family, which neither Vasantha ever had. We were the only people who parted on principle because we felt, and I still think, that although Mahindra Rajapaksa himself deserves a lot of credit for what he achieved in getting rid of the tigers and bringing peace to this land and development. And even someone I don't have a great regard for, Basil Rajapaksa, was a good developer. Now you don't have good governance, you don't have development, you have economic chaos. The way that Nivad Cabral handled the central bank, which led to massive animosity on the part of people like Ranil Vikramasinghe, is now shown to have been ideal compared with the mess that Ranil and Anjana Mahendra created. And, you know, Indrajit Kumar Swami, who's an admirable person, uh, the rumor that he was being pushed into resignation last week by the Prime Minister, I think is symptomatic of the fact that Ranil doesn't know what he's doing, he's destroying his friends, like Indrajit, and the country is just not moving forward. The debt now is massive compared to it, what we had, and there's been no development. Yeah, Professor, but uh, let's, let's try to be productive uh, and look forward. What can, I mean, you're an academic, you have you know, decades of experience in, in this field and in academia. How do we move forward in a productive, progressive way? Well, I think the first thing is to fulfill, well, two of the cardinal promises of the President's manifesto. The one that we were totally betrayed on, totally betrayed, was the change in the electoral system. You know, when the opposition at the time consented to pass the 19th Amendment. Uh, and you know that was a, bad, a good thing. But twin to it were two essential things to change the culture. One is changing the electoral system. And Rani has just stalled and stalled and stalled. And the President Sirisena promised us, he promised the government group that he would make sure electoral reform was passed before he dissolved parliament. And when he broke his promise, I think a lot of us were disappointed because he's created a mess for himself. You know, and I think the reason he broke that promise, which was very sad, was there was a lot of, a lot of pressure from Western countries who were precipitating a general election because Ranil had gone crying to them and said, there's a vote of no confidence against me. You know, please, please don't let it happen. So there was a lot of pressure. And contrary to a specific promise, without electoral for reform, parliament was dissolved. We had, again, the old system. And, you know, Sirius, President Sirisena has recently said this election costs money. We kept telling him that. So I think it was really remiss of him. And he owes the country now to just say electoral reform first. That is one. Second is this massive cabinet. It is unconscionable for a government that came to power promising to restrict the cabinet to have allowed this. Of course, the joint opposition is to blame because this they put in the constitution that you could have a national government without defying a national government. Unacceptable. The court should have struck that down because the national government means X. It's not a national government that we have because, you know, a large majority of the voters didn't want a national government. Certainly not one led by Rani Vikramasekha. And the second factor is that the joint opposition expanded it to allow any parliament to play this game, which is a fraud on the people. And look at the mess in cabinet. There's no coordination. Uh, you know, this whole idea of the super minister. You know, it's just, uh, I suspect Ranil wants now to become a super minister because there's no one else whom he trusts of honesty and integrity. You know, he stuffed the cabinet full of crooked or stupid people. He's left out the really bright people in the UNP, like Iran Vikramatna or Harsha de Silva. And the result is chaos. Far too many old stagers with no capacity. And because there's no limit, we're not going to move forward. So those are two things President Sirisena must seriously address. And in order to do this, he must open up 
negotiations with the joint opposition and what I would call the balanced people amongst it. You know, I told Mahindra Rajpaksa so during the last election, I think President Sirius and I said I was wrong to sack those secretaries. But I told President Mahindra Rajpaksa the problem is people on your side were saying, you know, we'll get rid of him when we win. Not Mahindra Rajpaksa himself. He said, no, 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 that was various younger people. I said, yes, but it allowed the people who don't like you to panic President Sirisena. So he, he sacked those guys. But he should be talking to the people in the joint opposition who are very happy to continue with him as president. There are some people who want to get rid of him, but he was elected president and he's still very popular in the country. And he should work with them to bring forward a reform agenda, which was what was promised in January 2015 and those promises have been ignored. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, Professor Vijay Singh, uh, let's talk about the role of the opposition in a country. Do you think the present day opposition is doing enough? Is it really fulfilling its role? I think the present opposition as represented by the forces led in parliament by I think Dinesh Gunawardena is doing its best under difficult circumstances. I think one of my saddest revelations was the way Karuja Surya's speaker completely caved in to a lack of principle which I'd never thought of him before and appointed Mr. Sambandha as leader of the opposition. That was not correct. My father way back in 77 told uh, President Jawadhan he should not have appointed Mr. Amitalinga because the joint opposition is the alternative government. And although that electoral system meant the SLFP had very few votes. But let us say that Jawadna at least had numbers on his side. You know, Amit Lingam had more seats than Mrs. Bandranaka had. But that serves to drive opposition underground. That is why over the next few years, opposition went underground, especially after he took away Mrs. Bandranaka's civic rights. But this time, Karu had not even that excuse to not appoint the largest single grouping. And given that they're not given proper representation in various places, I think they are doing their best. It, it is a pity that President Sirisena, who is the leader of the UPFA, doesn't talk to them more actively. But I think there's a lot of bitterness on some people on his side. Those who crossed over late, by the way, who have to prove their loyalty, not people like us who took a decision when it was dangerous. People who cross the late have to keep telling me, no, no, we love you and we hate Mahindra Rajapaksa. Just as there are people on the other side who have to go to Mahindra Rajapaksa and say, we love you and we hate him. So this compromise has to be with people like Gotabe Rajapaksa, Chamal Rajapaksa, people like Mahinda Amaravira in the government, who are real gentlemen, John Seneviratna. These are the people who can actually take their celebrity so, forward. So what you're saying in effect is that there needs to be more communication between the various factions. There needs to be more negotiations and that is lacking more in the More discussion presidency. and also the president must realize that if he goes on with Ranil Vikramasinghe, we're heading for disaster. We haven't seen such a state of simmering anarchy. You know, this business at Hambantota, this hammering of the journalist, the strikes about, you know, the, the, the new transport laws and so on and so forth. It is simmering anarchy and there is no sense of anyone going forward. You know, Mahindra Rajapaksa for five years led a country that was united except for Anil and Mangla Samari. You know, even people like Karu and Sajid Prevajas have supported him to get rid of terrorism. In the next five years, although, as many of us thought, things got bad and there wasn't enough responsible organized government, there was at least a development agenda. Now you have a situation where having criticized a lot of the activities of the last government, this government is doing it in spades. You know, all the dealings with the Chinese and not been against them. But you also have to remember that the Chinese, who are very fond of the Rajpaksa government and gave a lot of concessionary loans, are not fond of this government. I mean, why should they be? They're being insulted all the time. So they will do everything on a very commercial basis. And of course, there are enough people in the government who take full advantage of commercial bases. You know, and sadly, and to me the saddest thing, given the family I come from, is that, you know, in the old days I could stand up for Ranil. But Ranil's dishonesty, the way he's been making money for his party, not for himself, through things like the bond, 
I mean, everyone knows it. So everyone knows that this government is open season for bribery and corruption. It's ac not acceptable. And I think President Sirisena has to realize that he's going to head for disaster unless he reasserts what I would call SLFP values. So, Professor, you spoke about development under the previous regime. But there are development projects uh, being undertaken by the current government as well. I mean, we see the um, megapolis development. We see uh, the financial city uh, project uh, being initiated. I mean, these are also development there projects are lots of massive of development scales. development projects. What I mean by development is things that mean something to the people of this country. What Mahindra Rajapaksa did was transport, which was transformed under him, was electrification. You know, I used to do a lot of work in the North and East, a lot of work on irrigation projects. There should have been more. What Ranil Vikram Singh is doing is he sees development as being about not even crony capitalism, but capitalist cronyism. How do you give more and more and more profits to the non-productive service sector? You know, I, I just have I sent a letter to the Prime Minister's Office on Industrial Policy. We are working you know, through vocational training with sector councils, very bright people. The manufacturing people have given us a very good plan. But one point they made, and which is agreed, the ADB agreed with me on this yesterday, Sri Lanka needs an industrial policy. And what does Ranil do? But of course, Basil Rajapaksa did the same. They entrust industries to Richard Badiuddin. What sort of policy do you expect? If you're going to have real productive activity, you need intelligence, you need integrity, you need coherence. And what does Ranil do? He gives key portfolios to people with neither morality nor capacity. What is this about? Professor, even under the pre uh, previous regime, uh, Mr. Badruddin was exactly uh, what I the said. Minister of Industry That's and exactly Commerce. That's exactly what I said. I said that, I just said that, but that was one of the reasons why President Rajapaksa lost so badly in the North. Because, uh, you know, as you know, uh, instead of his development going in, Basil gave a lot of responsibility to Richard Badruddin. He nearly destroyed uh, a, an EU project because Richard and another person who is now clinging to the present government tried to stop him. It was only after I spoke to Mahindra Rajpaksa himself, uh, having consulted the UN, that he got it going again. But that sort of trust, what happens? Ranil, uh, you know, Sumantaran told me, because he said, you know, how could they serve in a cabinet with someone like Richard? And uh, he said, well, Ranil said, no, no, we had to promise him industries if he was going to cross over. So, you know, when you have that sort of situation, which Ranil called bribery in the case of this Satanayaka, I think it's absolutely outrageous. How can you go forward? You need courage. You need to say, Richard, you're a lovely guy. I don't agree, but if you want to flatter him, say you're a lovely guy. Please go, uh, go and you know look after cultural affairs or something. Industry, professor. I mean. um, the Constitutional Council and um, the way forward. Now we're talking about a third Republican constitution. How do you view this? Do you think uh, do you think Sri Lanka needs to have a third Republican constitution? Because um, <clears throat> there are areas where the constitution doesn't cover, for example, um, equality with regard to uh, sexual orientation, for example, is, is not covered. We need stronger laws uh, with regard to hate speech. Um, you know, what is really sad is everyone is trying to reinvent the wheel. In 2005, mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry, 2009, when I was Secretary of the Ministry of Disaster Management Human Rights, we produced a draft new Bill of Rights. Uh, that had been pledged by Mahindra Rajpaksa in 2005. When I became Secretary, I found nothing had been done. It had been entrusted to Jayantati Vikram Ratna, who, you know, I think because by then he was not getting on with Mahindra Rajpaksa, wasn't doing anything. But I persuaded Jayantati to chair the committee again, did a good job, we had excellent input. And then sadly, when it finished, I told Mahindra Samra Singh, put it to the President. And he said, no, 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 now it's the election season. And I said, just put it on the websites. And he wouldn't. In the end, afterwards, when you know human rights had been taken away from, uh, well, Mahinda was given a ministry that was not up to his talents. He's a very capable man. He was doing plantation industries. He should have been made foreign minister. And then what happened? The Bill of Rights was forgotten. I put it on the website. I kept agitating for this. I kept telling when we were doing my my policy Sena's manifesto. I said, put this in. It's already prepared. And I told Jambati, you're the one who did it. 
by the way, it had sexual orientation. And when I told Mahindra Rajapaksa about this, you know, that he should put the Bill of Rights, he said, well, there are some things I don't like. So I said, like what? He said, like sexual orientation. I said, you know, okay, then you drop that one. I was weak enough to say that, but put the rest in, because the rest is admirable. But no one is even looking at that Bill of Rights we drafted. And why I'm sad is it is, it can't be because of any animosity towards it. So I don't know, you know, when I sent Chandrika Kumaratunga the uh, reconciliation policy we had also prepared, and which again Mahindra Rajpak said ignored, um, she said, yes, there are nice things in it, I'll incorporate in mine. She hasn't even produced it. Two years down the line, no reconciliation policy. I produced mine. In six months consulting Sumantara, Niran Vikramanayat, uh, Javid Yusuf, uh, Javan Tyagaraja, a good cross section of really admirable people. Chandika hasn't done anything since. So, what she's doing is allowing Columbus 7 to do dancing all over the place. But oh, she spent her time attacking Mahindra Rajpaksa. So her letter to me said, Well, I'll use some of this. I don't understand why you thought Mahindra Rajpaksa would be interested. He has no love for this at all. I mean, that woman is so bitter Professor. that she cannot produce reconciliation. But the point I'm making yeah. is that we are reinventing wheels. When we have everything, you have drafts, you can amend the drafts, but they want to appoint committees. And but those committees, as you know, look at the present way the constitution is being done. It's a top-down effort. There's no, but there, there were public representations th committee there reports. Public re you know how many people used to go to those? You know, my, my friend Basant Senayaka went to talk to one of the committees, there are about three MPs there. I had the same problem with, you know, that committee that was supposed to uh, produce a new draft with the TM and the TNA talks broke down. Mm. You know, we went there, half the committee wasn't there. The par you know, because of this electoral system, half the parliamentarians cannot concentrate on these things. So the committees consist of two or three people. That has been the case ever since the 77 constitution and JR's electoral system. Because people, you know, in the old days, you selected your MP, the two parties or the three parties, selected a man of capacity. Now you have to select the thugs. Because otherwise you can't win on this system. And that is why, as I said, the biggest betrayal of this government is the failure to introduce electoral reform. And I think without that, we will get nowhere. Do you think that um, the constitution will be a success? Not at all. Because the public has been consulted. The public has been consulted across different fora. People from 25 districts have been consulted. I personally know a lot of no, individuals no, no, and people groups who wrote have in gone. A lot. People wrote in a lot. It's like when the education reform bill came. You know, we wanted in 2010, there was a new education act. A lot of parliamentarians went in. Banlo Ginoganda decided to consult everybody. Every day we had groups and groups coming in, all saying the same thing. The main point is what should happen is an enunciation of constitutional principles. Since we don't even know the principles, some people say get rid of the presidency, others say keep the presidency. The logic of an executive presidency, which I happen to think is very essential at this time, entails not having a cabinet in parliament, because, you know, you cannot mix two things together. Separation of powers means executive should not be involved in electoral politics. None of those principles have been discussed first. You can't go into details without deciding on the principles. How we did the Bill of Rights, how we did the Human Rights Action Plan, is we first worked out the underlying principles. That has not been done. So if you look at, you know, the way I would approach a constitution is what are the big problems? And those are obvious the electoral system the failure to get representation to the people the lack of a consultative local government system you know one of the things that we are trying to do is a nice man called Rana Berger, who was secretary of local government very bright he's now being persecuted in one of the worst excesses of this government you know on the Vinagumar, they not only arrested Basil Rajpaksa, so which I think is vindictive they could have settled the matter differently they arrested this Rana Berger, who was one of the best public servants and they were trying to have a new local government act which entrenched consultation. The real problem now is government is alienated from the people. The president in his manifesto said one very important thing. He wanted to make the divisional secretariat the center, Kendra, for service delivery to the people. No one has done anything about it. No one even has read his manifesto. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very, very sad that the fundamental principles of governance have not been addressed. But do you think there's the political will and the leadership to uh, sort of progress ahead? 
Not at all, because when you have everyone squabbling about whether you want to get rid of the executive presidency. I mean, that's a fundamental. It's uh, very interesting that you use that word squabbling, because uh, that's the next point that I want to move on to. Why is it that our parliamentarians squabble instead of talking policy in parliament? Because you, the way parliamentarians are selected creates what I would call squabblers rather than thinkers. How do we create thinkers? I told you you have a system whereby you have constituencies and each party selects the best candidate. And once you select a good person through a certain filter, at least you can assume that the man can face an interview, that the man can actually give some ideas. That is how you select candidates, not this free for all where, you know, because of this stupid system, everyone gets a chance to put one of their relations in. Everyone gets a chance to, you know, put someone who's able to produce a great deal of money because you need money for these elections. It's pitiful. So I think the total incapacity of anybody to address this serious issue. You know, we don't prioritize in this country. And as I've told you, there are two absolute priorities if we are going to get out of this mess that's been created by Jar Wardena. The electoral system must go and the cabinet must be statutorily limited. I don't I think even 30 is too much. If you look at the number of people working. You know, I still I pride myself. You know, when I was a state minister, everyone else was thinking of election. And a couple of journalists have said, yours is the only ministry where things are moving forward. But of course, the government didn't like that. So they stopped me working. So you actually have a real situation where you can count on the fingers of one hand ministers who are being productive at the moment. Professor, we're on to our final three minutes of the show. As you were a, a former um, Minister of Higher Education, State Minister of Higher Education, I'd like to um, pose the final question on the topic of education because this is one way that we can, as a country, move forward. How urgent are education reforms for Sri Lanka? Absolutely essential. The failure of this government to move constructively and creatively is very sad. And it's also very sad that no one knows what's happening. You know, the Prime Minister announced that he was going to have 13 years of education. I have had three people giving me different views on when this is to be implemented. The Director General of the Advanced Technical System, it comes under the High Education Ministry, said, you know, because we are doing a lot of reforms in vocational training, he said, well, what's the point? They're starting it next year. In the Prime Minister's office, the chair of the subcommittee said we're starting in 2018. The secretary to the ministry said they're starting in 2019. The ADB discussed the Prime Minister's proposals for reform and gave me their comment. They said it's not a secret. Basically said this is rubbish. They're not well thought out. You're not addressing the real issues. As you know, you had rent seekers amongst those who actually campaigned for the present president, for those who thought they get office. So they were appointed to the NIE, you know, people like Ranjit Devapriya and Rangoda. Because they were there, the NIE never met, so there was no policy formulation. They clung to office. Ultimately, they were summarily sacked, which I think was unfortunate because, uh, you know, there was no reason given. But, but, you know, it showed you the quality of the people clinging to office when they were not wanted and when they couldn't do any work. So how do we move forward? So you actually have to have an intelligent minister of education and you have to coordinate. I think what the president should do, if you want a super minister, have a minister of human development resources. Mahindra Samra Singh is admirably equipped to do this. He can work very well with the very good man, Mohandas Silva, who is chairman of the UGC. And you can have better people in education. And you can coordinate, because you have to coordinate education. You have to start giving fundamental principles as to what the purpose of education is. You know, at the moment, you have no expectations of what the O-level means. All they say is O-level means equivalent to O-level. You have to give skills to people. You have to think, but Akila Viraj cannot think. Professor, on that note, uh, we will have to wrap up this conversation. Uh, Professor Rajivar Vijay Singh, of course, a very vocal uh, on, with his uh, comments. Uh, we wrap up this edition of Newsline. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you.